my name is Amara Jones, and I am the host of this trans, um, of trans mic, uh, Twitter space that talks about um, f a full range of whatever topics are popular um, here on that uh, here um, on Twitter that focus on the uh, trans community and beyond. And it's no surprise, therefore, that we would be talking this week with um, Jamila Lemieux about her piece uh, in Vanity Fair that ran last week called The Black Ass Lie of Dave Chappelle. Um, I want to recommend you to read it for so many different reasons. Um, first of all, it's just a cracking ass, amazing piece of writing. Um, it's an incredible incredible example of what honest, clear writing can do. Um, and secondly, because it unpacks so many issues within Blackness and the ways in which Blackness has to unpack itself in order to get free. And Jamila just does that in such amazing, clear ways. It's not a surprise. It is what she does as a writer and um, a critic and a general thinker. And that's why I was thrilled when I reached out um, and you said yes, that you were willing to have this conversation, um, that you did so. So Jamila, I just want to thank you so much for this piece and for all of your work and for joining us from wherever you're driving. <laughs> Oh, how old? How old are they? She'll be, uh, I have a daughter, she'll be nine, so. Oh, okay. Well, you're about to go into that phase. Um, but, yeah, that's a, still a, a great age. Um, that may actually be a good place to start. Um, you know, one of the things that you talk about is that you grew up believing the, the black-ass lie of Dave Chappelle even at great cost. And I'm wondering if you can just reframe for us and for everyone who's listening what the black ass lie is and what do you hope that your daughter doesn't hope believing about herself within the context of blackness that he lays out? Sure. Um, and thank you, Amara, so much for your kind words and your support of you know my work and this article in particular and for having me in your space. It means a lot. Um, I, okay, so for one thing I do want to clarify, it's not Dave Chappelle's Black Ass Lie, it's Dave Chappelle and the Black Ass Lie. The right. Lie is so, it's so much bigger than him, he didn't construct it, he's the victim of it, we're all victims of it, mm. you know? Um, it's this idea that is pervasive among Black folks, and I would imagine some of our observers, that Black men, and the word, when I say Black men, think Black cis het men. And I'll clarify that in a second. But the idea that black cishet men have, it's so much work. The cishet is silent, right? Because they'll say black men, but they mean black cishet men. We believe that black cishet men have it worse than other groups of black people, right? That includes black women, cis and trans, that includes black queer men, that, that essentially the men who we identify as men, the men who we are comfortable calling men have it worse than the rest of us. And as a result of that, there's this there's this sense of loyalty that we think of as being this reciprocal thing, right? But there's a sense of duty and loyalty and service because we see how our men and boys are treated. We want to be a balm for that. We want to heal that. Um, we don't want to uh, support the stereotypes and the horrible things that are said about them, right? These are all noble intentions, right? We think about the violence that's been enacted against them, and we believe that they have it worse, and as a result, that prevents us from being able to, one, address the ways that Black women and Black LGBTQ plus people are uniquely disenfranchised on the basis of their identities, right? That we too are going through specific things based on what kind of black person we are right so they're the things we could say all black people deal with this right all black people are subject to living in a community that's destroyed by redlining 
you know, most black people are subject to, you know, living under conditions where they have substandard access to food and health care and top quality schools, right? So those are our collective black struggles. But then there are things that meet you at your specific intersection where your identities are. Right. And so there's this idea that our men, our black cishet men are having that experience and that the rest of us somehow are not or that what we are enduring is inconsequential by comparison because black men have it so bad that completely erases the fact that we're living in a patriarchy. Right. That means that cishet men have unique power and privilege as it relates to black women as it relates to black lgbtq plus people and so to heal ourselves to free ourselves to address white supremacy means that we have to be addressing these things at home too but most of us are just simply raised to believe otherwise and so when you stand up and you know defend black trans lives when you stand up and identify yourself as a feminist uh, or, or someone who's concerned with any of those other groups that are not covered in what is typically thought of as black men, you are very easily cast as doing something harmful or, or having some sort of hatred toward black men or that you somehow are working in service of white supremacy. And this is a myth. This is untrue, right? Like, I, I, I know that I have seen black trans women in particular show up over and over and over again to support, uh, to, to fight for justice for murdered black cishet men, knowing that the community would not show up in the same way for you. I see it too much to just not be completely just brokenhearted and infuriated at the idea that advocating for ourselves is somehow advocating against the general black good but until we you know in mass address that way of thinking like we have to get to a, a place of understanding about the fact that all black people are suffering and that we should be allies in struggle but some of us are making the struggle infinitely harder for others. They're the only privilege that you can access in white supremacy is the privilege that your gender gives you or that your class gives you. And so we have um, instances of violence and instances of abuse and neglect against black women and against black LGBTQ plus people that are, we're supposed to somehow be hands off or forgiving or, or you know, not wanting to see these brothers held accountable for these actions because they're brothers. I'm sorry. I know I'm just scrambling at this point. No, I mean, I think that the point here is that there is a lot to unpack, right? It's one of the reasons why your article is so extensive is because this is not an easy thing to spotlight and to talk about. And it is in incredibly layered. Um, I think, um, you know, at the beginning, I did say it's the Black Ass Live Dave Chappelle. I guess I did so because right now he's the poster boy for the Black Ass Lie and embraces it with extreme abandon and without reflection. Um, but as you have pointed out in your article, you know, and as you just said, it's something that all Black people do on some level. You spoke about how even Black feminists who laid the groundwork for intersectionality um, at the Kambahi River Collective statement, how they felt the need to declare their support for Black men, for example. Um, and I think well, well, that... No, I, actually, well, I, I don't want to conflate those two things. Mm. Like, I, I don't think it was wrong. I think it was important that the sisters at Combahee, you know, stated their support of black men because, you know, it was also like we are expecting something in return for this support. We are expecting to be supported as well. So we are not supporting your right to engage in patriarchal violence, right? We are, we are supporting your right to be free, right? And, and that we should be aspiring to the same type of freedom. But unfortunately, we got a group of us that are aspiring to a freedom that is them having power over the rest of us. Right, but I, that context is important, but I think that throughout what we do see 
constantly is this idea that black women in fighting for our freedom constantly feel the need to say that we're also fighting and care about the um, the freedom for black men with the idea that that will be reciprocated or should be reciprocated or culturally it's something that we have to do when there's plenty of historical evidence to show the opposite. And so it's, it's interesting to me that it's something that continues to happen even as there's plenty of evidence that it's not a two-way street, as you say, or a multi- way street if we include all the intersections of black people you know something bell hooks um talked about that i I, i've been grappling with lately which is the lack of feminist writing about men you know particularly during the uh the the days of our foremothers and the people we you know during the days of palm bahi um like and, and alice walker and tony morrison and uh you know, Paula Giddings, like that they were off feminist women were oftentimes writing about, you know, the lives of the people who they were looking to save, right? Which totally makes sense. Um, but we can't just leave the men to their like we have to figure something out for them, right? Like we have to figure out like we do want them free. We do want them to support us. We can't keep doing what we've been doing which is the majority of us not having that attitude right like there hasn't been a feminist movement in our community there hasn't been you know um like there just hasn't right and so but i i I don't it's not about saying we need to divest from this idea of supporting the men and hope they'll support us it's about how we prioritize our support how we give it out right like that it's not with reckless abandon and just hear any man who wants it can have it because he's my black brother, right? It's like saying this black brother has been harmful. And so what I support for him is appropriate accountability, right? Like I, like that's not what we've done historically, which is this brother has been accused of being harmful. I'm going to stand behind him because he's my brother. I just have his back no matter what. Does that make sense? It does. But I think that I would push a little bit on that. And I would say, isn't the, isn't by continuing to center them and how we need to fix them and how we need to change them and how they need to do this and how they need to do that, that we're actually continuing to center the problem? I mean, I think that that's... Well, that's not centering them. There's a difference between including them in your, you know, intellectual and real life practices of figuring out what, what revolution looks like and what freedom, you know, can feel like. But there's a difference between saying at the center of our work is fixing our stuff with black men. At the center of our work is, Mm -hmm. um, you know, healing them. We have to be at the center of our work. We also have to realize that so, like, we are not extricable from them. These are our fathers. These are our, you know, the other half of our community. They have an a tremendous amount of influence over our lives. Right. So is it our best interest to work toward healing that saves us? You know what I mean? Right. But I think it has to behave the way that they do. You know, we can date who we want. We can partner. You know, you can make other like if that's how someone feels, if someone wants to be in community with other people because they don't feel safe in community with their own men. Like that's troubling. But it's also quite understandable for, you know, people who've had certain experiences or who live in certain parts of the country and haven't had access to, you know, uh, a diversity of, of brothers. But like, these are the men and boys that come from our bodies and that produce us. So we're as doomed as they are. You know what I mean? We're as successful as they are. Like we're so deeply connected to them that I, I, I sometimes worry about. There's a difference between like censoring them, but also realizing that they're a part of our story and we need their foot off our necks badly. And, you know, what is the best strategy for getting it off? Right. I think that that really is the question. And I think that one of the things for me that I, I'm, that I wrestle with that I'm, you know, that I think um, is, is the frame that you just used it's too e- isn't it easy isn't it too easy or i would say it's it would be very easy to fall back into the familiar trope of of centering them by default that is to say if we begin to think about the ways in which we need to um 
do all of the things that you just mentioned, I mean, that that is a very, it's not that hard to see how we start thinking about them. I'll give you an example. So I um, was talking to a friend of mine um, who's trans, black trans woman, um, uh, two summers ago when there was, you know, yet again, a record spate of murders of black trans women at the hands overwhelmingly of black men, black cis men, overwhelmingly, like 90%. Um, and it's really interesting the ways in which um, uh, domestic violence uh, for black cis women, we know that, for example, um, black cis women have the highest levels of intimate partner murders and violence than any other group of women in the United States. And it's very interesting that for black trans women, um, the, 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 the pattern of murders tracks that exact same way. That is to say, black trans women are murdered by black cis het men who know us, who often love us or are in relationships with us, et cetera. So I was having a conversation with her about that. And I was saying, um, you know, I just said to her, she was like, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, you know what? We have to start demanding that they do better. We have to just start demanding that um, black men fundamentally um, have to do better and we don't make excuses for them in society. We have to stop coddling them. We have to stop, um, we have to demand in some ways that they grow up. Um, you know, because you center the needs of kids. You don't center the needs of adults. So they have to grow up. And so, and then she said to me, she goes, well, what about, what about um, the racism that they face? And what about their PTSD? And what about their trauma? And then I just cut her off. And I said, you grew up poor and, um, you know, in an incredibly violent neighborhood. What about your PTSD? And what about your trauma? But you're not out here murdering people. And so what I mean is that, like, even if we if we center, if we not center, I keep using that word, but I think that if we if we spend a lot of time trying to find a way to make black men better in this way, isn't it easy to fall into what my friend did, which is to begin to make excuses for them and to fall into the traditional patterns of continuing to put their needs first? No, because I think we have to stop those murders from happening, right? Like, we have to decree. Like, our community has always had an incredibly high threshold for violence against Black female bodies, right? Cis and trans. Like, our community is comfortable with those high, with those rates of intimate partner violence. People say it as if, oh, you know, everyone knows this. Everyone knows it, but it's not addressed. It's not it's not treated as something that is of any urgency or some sort of societal emergency, right? It's just taken for granted that, of course, Black women have the highest rates of, of intimate partner violence. That PTSD manifests differently in us than it does them, you know, and in a rape culture in a white supremacist, you know, hetero masculinist uh, patriarchy, men are socialized to do acts of violence. Men are taught violence from birth. And so it's no surprise that that's what we're getting, you know, and that we uh, bear the brunt of the pain and the frustration that they can't, ex uh, you know, express to the white man. Now, I'm not saying that to say, like, we give them an excuse or a pass, but to understand that is to understand what we're up against and how do we begin to have conversations where we get folks on board with doing the work that needs to be done to address the behavior in boys. Because mm -hmm. before you have men, you have boys. And you absolutely can't say that we just, you know, we, we don't set, you know, in, in being clear about not censoring or over prioritizing the males that we're not addressing black boyhood black boyhood is critical right because if there is not that interruption of violence then if someone is not telling you then how you can express your feelings that you can be attracted to any number of genders that you have a right to to you know exist in the world as you see fit and that you owe other people that same decency like if you're not getting that as a young man then you're not going to, you know, then it's going to be a take a whole lot of work and usually some woman, you know, sacrificing to get that through your head um, later in life. And we're, we're left in danger. And so I understand. I don't think that the entirety of those of us that are mobilized to free black women and to free black trans uh, and, and queer people and, you know, other 
uh, marginalized black folks who are not black cis head men. Like, we're not all going to be doing the work of addressing the men. I understand that, right? Like, I think there are enough roles to play where some of us can say, look, this has to be part of the work, and some of us have to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen men change. Now, granted, these are not the men who I think were at risk for murdering someone. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right? But, like, but, I, but I've seen men's misogyny, you mm -hmm. know, begin to erode away. I've seen their attitudes change and, and, and then change in how they engage with, with women and with LGBTQ people. I've seen it happen, you know? And, like, we, we have to continue to see those things happen. But, no, I do not think that is the center of the work, and I do not think that is everyone's work. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point. And one that is true for all parts of our movement is that not everyone can be doing everything, but in order for us to get free, everything has to be done um, mm -hmm. because the problems are so kind of tough and intractable. Um, one of the things I wanted to just talk about is, um, a lot, you know, um, the work of Dr. Carolyn West, who is a, a black woman who has done a lot of research on the history of black women's bodies. And one of the things that she points out is how black women did not gain full control of our bodies until the 1980s. Um, and talks about how this centering of, of black men that you, um, that you reference, um, you know, started during slavery. And um, it was the case, according to a Supreme Court ruling, that rape of black women by black men um, was not considered to be rape because black people were considered to be property. There was no instance of a violation of humanity. And so it, th this, this hierarchy, this hierarchy of bodies and, who's, and, and priority has a very, very, very long tradition um, for us in this country. And I think it's, it, it, it goes into one of the things that you write about, which is how layered um, it is um, and how pervasive. Um, I just wanted to quote from your article because this is one of the things that struck me. Um, you wrote, quote, Black Americans are not solidly unified around many things aside from the desire to be free. And we don't all agree on what freedom looks like. We don't have a singular political agenda, nor a governing document that lines up our shared values. Even within the massive force that we call, quote, the Black Church, close quote, there are strikingly different directives about how we do and, and should live, and that you essentially go on to say that one of the things that actually unites us is the black ass lie. And so one of the things I'm wondering is, is you know, isn't it true that what we actually need is a new vision of freedom? Because if we don't have that, we're gonna continue to rely on the only thing that unites us th is this black ass lie, which has these roots um, in our very oppression. I'm sorry, can you restate the question? Yeah, my question is that in order, of, we often talk about black liberation, black liberation, black liberation. And for often times, black liberation is just seen as the absence of oppression, right? It's just the absence of, of white patriarchy, but there's no unity on actually what black liberation looks like aside from the absence of, of white oppression and white patriarchy. And for me, my question is that I, one of the a part of the work is to develop actually an idea of what black liberation looks like, which as a part of it has to be um, black liberation for all of us. It has to be um, a sense of um, of of solidarity, the absence of patriarchy, um, the ability to have power and decision making, not be centered in one group of people as we think about it, for it to be um, for it to be uh, one that is much more collective in nature. Like there are all these things that we have to reimagine, and that a part of that has to be the destruction of black patriarchy. But right now, what black liberation looks like, especially for a lot of black men, is just the as Brittany Cooper puts it all the time, just the ability to do what white men do, right? That's what the absence of white patriarchy looks like for them. Absolutely, you know, and um, it, it's, I often cite Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, right? That it's, you know, been so often the nature of the oppressed not to uh, want to end all oppression, but to become the oppressor. You know, and I don't think that's necessarily true of us all, 
right? Because I don't see black trans women describing a future in which, you know, mm-hmm. they, they have the ability to be harmful or to have undue, you know, um, uh, ju- uh, say over someone else's movements in the society. Uh, I think that we have to challenge this lie, right, that exists, this idea of our men having it worse. And I think we have to challenge this idea of freedom being patriarch, you know, just black patriarchy on top, right? I, I think that's incredibly important that we talk about what does freedom look like and, you know, asking everybody to get on board with a known abuser because he's a really dope activist um, is not freedom, right? Asking everyone to uh, stand alongside a woman who's been accused of harming her partner because she's the first lesbian to occupy a particular position is not liberation or freedom, right? That's the same bullshit we've been experiencing. It's just putting somebody else in, you know, that that seat of, of hierarchy, right? So, like, what freedom has to look like for us is the absence of hierarchy. That's right. That's right. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to, um, ask you about is, um, you mentioned, I'm, I have my notes here and now I am losing them. Um, um, was, oh, this is, I found it, um, is one of the things you say is that a part of the work for some people in our community is to begin to engage men in this conversation, because as you said, you've had, You've seen the shift that that cis men have made. But one of the questions that I have is that in your article, you write about how, um, you know, as a result of the black ass lie, this is a quote, quote, as a result of the black ass lie, identifying as a black feminist is akin to identifying as a hater of black men in the eyes of many, many, and disloyalty to black men is one of the greatest crimes a black woman can commit, close quote. So I'm wondering how you believe that those that people with a black feminist lens and women, black women who are feminists can engage men in this conversation with that as the default starting point that, you know, if you, that they would perceive you almost immediately as many have done in this, even in writing this article, um, as it being an attack or you, um, casting aspersion on black men and reinforcing negative racial stereotypes about black men. Like how do you even start the conversation? One, you have to, for anybody who's attempting to do that type of work, whether you're doing it in a public space or if you're essentially just trying to have a conversation with a family member or other loved one, you know, prepare to have your heart broken a lot. Um, Prepare to be willfully misunderstood at times, but, you know, uh, go into it being as honest and clear as you possibly can while trying to keep reach people in the language in which they speak you know um i did my best to write this article in clear plain language and there were some things that were cut it's very long and it was much longer um there were some things that i wish that were still in there that i think may have been a little bit helpful for some of the black men that are stuck um engaging with it because i think one thing we have to realize is that you know, it's easy to feel hostile or angry or frustrated. Um, and for many of us, there are specific reasons to feel angry and hostile and frustrated in, in relationship to men in our lives. Um, but, and, and of course, you should be in a perpetual state of hostility, angry and frustration at patriarchy, right? Which is different than feeling it toward every man. Um, but, One thing that um, you have to keep in mind is that so much of men's identities, cishet men's identities, are based around the idea that they have it worse than you. Right. Whoever you are. So, you know, and, and, and you're attempting to tell them that something that they know about themselves to be true, something that gives them, you know, has given them cover mm-hmm. and, and perhaps for accountability for certain things throughout their lives. And don't get me wrong, it's a very complicated position that black men are in. And I wish that, you know, I'd articulated this more clearly in the piece and I, to be in the position of oppressed and oppressor. 
You know what I mean? When yeah. people are only talking to you about one part of that identity. So one part of it is true for you and one is real and one you can wrap your brain around. And the other is the only real source of power that you have in this society. Yep. And so I'm asking you to, you know, on some level, perhaps it's going to sound like I'm asking you to see yourself as the bad guy. You know, and this isn't necessarily like unless you're confronting someone's individual behavior. If you're talking about just having a general conversation about gender, it's the same way. You know how frustrating it can be, and that's why I don't do this. But for people who, because it's some, it's important work. It has to be done. Someone has to do it. I ain't the one. Some people sit down and have conversations with white folks at length about racism. I am not the one, nor the two. Don't call me third. You know what I mean? Like you better be at the bottom of the list before you got to call somebody to sit and handhold white folks through racism right but when it comes to gender and our men there is hand holding required and that is a maddening reality you know i wish i knew a solve for it i wish i knew an easier way you know um i have some ideas about mass gender re- uh education programs you know ways of getting information out that i'm hoping to work on in the future but like what you have to understand is that the average one of us, period, any of us, was raised with little to no uh, truthful perspective about gender and and relations between people uh, and um, on the basis of gender in this country. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like most yeah. of us were not taught to think of more than two genders. We were only taught, you know, to think of families as looking a certain way, even if we were from progressive households, you know, and, and what oftentimes passed for progress was, you know, we're nice to the other people. We don't, we think it's weird. We still laugh at it, you know, but we're nice to them versus being openly hateful and violent, you know, like, I mean, I just think of the things that were acceptable to say on television. I'm 37, so, like, you know, Chappelle uses the F word a few times. I had to go back and watch quite a few of his specials to write this story. And, you know, he was using the the F word as recently as 2017, you know, and it, it brought me back and made me think about the fact that, like, you could turn on Comic View or, or Def Comedy Jam or whatever white people were watching and hear those words with reckless abandon, there was a cultural re-education. That doesn't mean that we've, uh, you know, we've gotten to the promised land for accepting people being gay, but that progress has been made in our lifetime, you know, with regard to how people um, engage with the just the idea of homosexuality. Yeah. It's such a, a low bar for progress, but... You know, it's it's the one where, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, this is something that has shifted. So in our own community, if the idea of who you are is so deeply connected to having this power over these other people who look like you, how do I begin to take that? How, how do I take this away from you? And if I'm the guy who doesn't think of myself that way, I don't hit women, I'm not mean, I never call anybody that for, you know, how do I get this through to you? I'm asking you to completely challenge your 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 the way you see yourself and your relationship to the world around you. You know, how do I do that? It it takes time and patience. You know, I've cried a lot of tears over, you know, like I, I've spent a lot of time in conversations where I'm like, wow, we should be past this. You know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. It, but it has to be done. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And I think that what you laid out is that it's really hard work. Um, also, like, if you had so much more to say, this might be a book. I'm just saying. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, you know, uh, so let's, you know, um, we may have time for one question, and there are a couple of people I see in here. Bev, um, who's with the Anti-Violence Project. There's some other people if you want to ask a question. Um, feel free to think about it now and raise your hand. I'm going to kind of ask my last question of you. And if there's maybe one question or so, I'm happy to take that because um, we are at time. This is a topic where we could, of course, go much longer. Um, but I want to be respectful of Jamila's time and everyone else's. Um, I know for me that when I, before I write or before I speak, um, 
a lot of times that can be spurred by rage. Um, I know that my own personal reaction and my own personal um, use of my microphone against um, Dave Netflix and Chappelle was in part spurred by, you know, a deep rage. Um, and you mentioned that um, a feeling of anger was a part of, of writing this piece. But of course, it's also whenever we do these things, it's also out of hope right? That we believe that by saying something that things can change. And I'm wondering what, what the fundamental hope that you have, besides the obvious um, that will, you know, begin to end the black ass lie, but what is the thing that you hope to spur by, by writing and pouring all of this out um, um, that you had? What's the hope that you had by doing this, by writing this piece? You know, I wanted to inspire some meaningful conversations, and I know those are hard to come by these days. You know, like it's it's that I mean, controlled spaces like this are so good. You know, because we see how the conversation about the article devolved on Twitter, uh, or at least in my mentions. Yeah. But, um, but but I wanted to give people something. I, I just felt like this thing hasn't been quite said in this way. You know what I mean? Like there's something that I just, I felt like the lie part was missing. Like it's been articulated and like, you know, Brittany and her book and others have talked about like the fact that, you know, there's this idea of black men having it worse, but I feel like that we haven't really dealt with the level to which it has been, you know, completely assumed to be true and, and what that cost us. And so I wanted to raise attention for that, but I also wanted to, you know, um, you know, I just felt like what Dave, it's so easy to go along with the crowd and like when black men, when folks really love something, you don't want to be the one pointing out what's wrong with it, you know, and like, I felt like it was not fair for black trans people, black trans women in particular, to be carrying that load by themselves to again defend themselves. You know, um, but when I went back and really watched those specials, I, I didn't realize how bothered I was as a woman myself by the things they were saying because I just shut down that part of my brain to wow. try and entertain. You know what I mean? Like, I, there, I, don't get me wrong, I was always really bothered by the R. Kelly sketch and a, a few other little things, you know, but like, I didn't like the the amount of misogyny really hurt me and I allowed myself to be hurt by it for the first time as opposed to kind of just shred, you know, shrugging it off or like not watching it for a few years. You know what I mean? I was like, no, this hurt. This is hurtful, you know? And like, I just wanted something uh, valuable to come of it. And I just felt like, you know, the conversation about him, there was the obvious, there's a thing that has to be screened, which is like, yo, you can't just play around with black, with, with trans people's lives. Like, it's just too dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, you just can't make light of certain things because this is literally a life or death situation. You know? But the same can be said of women. You know? Of, yeah. of cis women too, right? You know, like, women in general. Like, and it's so, um, it incensed me and, and burnt me up in that way. And, uh, I just wanted, you know, I wanted people who were bothered by the out, like, I was writing this for the people who were bothered by the pushback to Chappelle, if that makes sense. Like, I wanted mm -hmm. them to understand, like, I get what he's doing. Like, I get, and I'm not saying it's like he's some diabolical figure. I don't think he's, you know any more ill intention than the average very privileged cishead man who can sit back and, 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 you know, be comfortable in his identity and not have to consider, you know, how him being comfortable in his identity uh, is, is something that he enjoys that the rest of us do not, you know, and then like, but I felt, people were so angry at the idea of Dave Chappelle being silenced. They're trying to cancel Dave Chappelle. He's talking about real stuff. You know, he's talking about, you know, race stuff. He's talking about the white man and they don't like that, you know, or the, or him making LGBT people white or, you know what I mean? Or implying that it was only white LGBT people coming at him. I just thought that was just something that we really need to like, demystify. You know what I mean? Like you cannot, it's not, you can't just conveniently render queer people white 
you know, trans people white, because when you do that, like you're perpetuating some really, you know, you're, you're leaving the door open for the perpetuation of this, you know, really unnecessary assault against black people. Like you're harming black people. So like, I don't, you know, if you never want to be a trans ally, if you never really give two shits about women, that's your business. But you get up on that stage and you identify yourself as somebody who is for black people, right? That like you are speaking up for black people. Well, you're leaving more than 50% of black people out when you speak for us. So, I, I, you know, I just, I wanted to challenge that. And then I wanted people to understand that he wasn't, nobody was trying to silence him because he was too black or too, you know, uh, too politically incorrect it's just that, that he's saying some stuff that that has some real meaningful ramifications for black people and that speaks to some stuff that we you know are grappling with yeah totally totally i get that we have one question and it will be the the we will end on this question um today and it is from and if i get your handle wrong you know forgive me um but it is ma'am it's sammy not sammy so i'm gonna bring you on as a speaker now and you can either you know add your contribution or ask your question let's see if you this works if you are you on hello. yeah yeah go ahead me? yeah we can hear you okay, hello um, Sammy, I use they them pronouns. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan of the um, Translash podcast. Um, Thank you. I really love that podcast so much, um, especially as a black trans person, I like it a lot. Thank you. Um, and I guess my question is, or like, I wanted to know, like, advice for talking to like the black men in my lives about like these issues, but like. Because, like, I, I, I do talk to, like, black men in my lives about, like, trans issues, feminist issues, and, like, other things like that, and, like, kind of, like, somewhat decentering them and saying, like, hey, like, there are other, like, black people out here that are suffering as well, other than, like, your issues. It's, like, yes, like, issues that happen to black men are important, but, like, there are other issues going on. Um, and a lot of time when I do this, like, I'm met with, I'm met with like, a lot of rage um, and just, like, Oh, like you're just putting us down, and then, and then, and it's like, no, I'm not trying to do that. Like, I'm trying to, because like, I, I do believe in liberation for all black people. Like, I want you to come with me. Um, and so, like, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, I don't know, I was wondering, you like, doing y'all have like any advice to like approach these conversations that hopefully don't like always like bring up rage in black men. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your comments about the Translash podcast. It comes back next Thursday. So um, look out for that. Um, Jamila, what, how do you approach these conversations with black men that may not be in the same place? What advice do you have? You know, I've had some successes and some failures. You know, sometimes that rage just happens. You know, sometimes you go in wanting to have a, a conversation other times you might just be too upset you could be triggered by you know um don't let the internet tell you you can't be triggered by things you might be really triggered by whatever this story is that you wanted to bring to them and their refusal to hear you out can be upsetting and you, you know you don't handle that well like these things can happen um you know i would just say think about time place and tone you know like is this person in the place where we can really even have this conversation? What were we talking about beforehand? You know, we just having a nice day and now, you know, it seems like I'm always bringing these things up, you know, or have we been arguing all day and now, you know, I want to talk about something serious and this is a rough time. Like, you know, try to reach people when they can hear you. And again, there are times where you don't have that convenience, where you're like, I have to tell you this thing because it is urgent to me. It is urgent, period. You know, but like when you're just trying to ha have one of those more, I call it evergreen, you know, it's not time sensitive. I just want to talk to this person because it's my father, it's my friend. You know, I care about them and, and I want them to better understand me and to better understand these things. You know, then you think about time and place and tone. And, you know, maybe open up with something along the lines of like, 
there's something I want to talk to you about, you know, and, and maybe you have a news story or something, right, that you've got. It's always good to have something that you can point to so you're not doing all the work by yourself. It can be an article that you read that was interesting. It could be something you've read in a book, you know. Um, it, it can be a piece of news, right, that you're reacting to and you want them to think about. Maybe, you know, something's happened in the news. It's an example of something you've been trying to communicate. And now you want to share this with them, you know, one thing you may want to say, you know, especially if this is someone you've had some issues with these kind of conversations um, with in the past, it's like, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about something, but first, like, I just want to make something clear. Like, I do not want you to think that I don't think Black cis head men have it tough when I bring up other identities. Like, I'm not trying, this is not a contest. There are just some things that you might not be thinking about because you weren't raised to think about them because none of us were, you know, things that most of us are not thinking about that are important and they're important to me. And I just really would like for you to give them some thought, you know, and one thing I say often is that, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. It means a lot to me. Sometimes I ask folks like not to immediately react, you know, like Hmm. sometimes it's like, can I give you something to think about? And we talk about it at another time or, you know what I mean? And like, or not, maybe it's just like, I just want to give you something to think about it, you know, and like leave the door open if they want to talk about it later. But it may be that you just needed to kind of drop that bomb on them and let them sit with it. And if it's somebody, you know, who, you, you feel like you all can have the conversation in real time once you've presented them with some information that's, you know, not what they're used to hearing, what they're used to thinking, you know, just remind yourself that one, everything in this man's life up until this point has taught him otherwise. That is what you're up against. So do not hold yourself up to the standard of some sort of master teacher who's supposed to come in and do a whole gender studies class and one conversation. You know, it's like, I, I think men love data, you know, statistics uh, and facts, unfortunately. <laughs> Not unfortunately, but, you know, these are things that are often cited as where's the facts, where's the data? There's plenty of it. There's an abundance of it, even with the lack of, you know, the the relative lack of statistical research about the lives of black women and black LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. um, There's still plenty of data to point to, you know, if if you want to have a conversation about black trans women. So Mm -hmm. you can say it may seem like no big deal to you to make this transphobic joke because you would never hurt a trans person. But, you know, when we have this culture of treating them as disposable in that way or it's treating them as creatures or as things that are not to be treated with with human worth and value, that does lead to their death. Mm -hmm. You can't take this lightly, right? You know, you um, just pace yourself and forgive yourself, you know, give yourself grace because it is very hard work. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think on the other spectrum, I think of an example of a friend of mine who um, I, I put up a post once and I said, if you're not talking to um, the men and boys in your life about the murder of black trans women, you're failing. She reached out to me and she goes, what can I do? And I said, well, you have um, a black son. Why don't you talk to him? It turns out that she did one better than that. That is to say, um, he was on a football team at a high school. She called not only him, but his entire team to her house. And she gave, wow. and she gave them all a speech about how trans women are women and that they're to be respected and that she never wanted to hear a a joke against a trans woman ever and that if any of them ever decided that they were interested in dating a trans woman that the others were going to be respectful of that and if it didn't happen they were going to have to answer to her and so that was that on that and that was her and this is what I, I you know like motherhood is a powerful tool right and you can use and she understood very much where her power was and she decided to flex it at that moment in order to make this point um and um i think that's another example that as you said we are raising boys and boys can be taught to behave differently um if they believe that the society and the people around them want them to behave differently and that's another thing that we can do um in some really powerful ways 
Um, so I wanted to thank you so much for um, this article, for your brain and for your brilliance and for your bravery, for your solidarity with Black trans women, understanding that this is a shared enterprise and liberation that we have. Um, I really appreciate that and have always appreciated that and want to encourage everyone to please go to Vanity Fair and to read Jamila's article, Dave Chappelle and the Black Ass Lie That Keeps Us Down. Jamila, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. And thanks to everyone for joining. Thank you. Okay, bye.